This audio isn't working, is it? All right. Welcome to Covenant Presbyterian Church, uh, adult education for there. May 24th, 2020. This is Pastor Jeff Fox Klein, and I will be uh, moderating this panel today, working differently in different times. And um, today we are talking to uh, people who work for the University of Wisconsin. We have three individuals here today working on the panel with us. We have TJ Sargent, um, who I am going to, oh, apparently I can't unmute you. I can only ask to unmute you. Um, so TJ, I'm going to ask to unmute you. We have TJ Sargent, who is the Assistant Director of Organizing, Advising, and Technology. He works with student leaders, so undergraduate, graduate, and professional, and student organizations, which would go from religious groups to sports clubs to international student groups to create um, outside the classroom learning and connection opportunities. Uh, TJ, you don't have to have anything prepared, but you want to just say hi? Hello? Audio seems to be working, folks. And that's TJ. My, my recommendation, if you are um, on Zoom, to go to speaker view. Speaker view will give you the best view of who is talking. Um, and as most people are muted, you don't need to see them sitting there watching. So I'd recommend going to speaker view if you know how. The next person on the panel is Karen Best, who is the senior lecturer at English as Second Language and Writing Center, um, who teaches academic writing primarily to international students um, in four credit classes and at the Writing Center. She works with faculty across campus on teaching academic writing to students for uh, whom English is their second language. Karen, I'm going to ask to unmute you too. Um, would you like to say hello? That's Karen. And finally, we have Brad Brown, um, who is the Professor of Human Development in the Department of Educational Psychology at UW-Madison. Welcome, Brad. I'm unmuting you. I don't even need to ask. I can just unmute you some, for some reason. Welcome, Brad. That's good. Thanks for having me. All right. So we are going to jump into uh, the first question. And the first question I'm going to ask to Karen um, what do you want people to know about your work during the pandemic? So in, in my program, the English department and teaching writing, um, you know, before the pandemic, we had a hybrid model. So we taught face to face, but of course, did so many things online, relied a lot on technology, different instructors to various degrees. So that's kind of like our pre pandemic modus operandi. And then of course, everyone probably knows at this time that you know everything at UW shifted to 100% online. So that was a big teaching shift and a, a shift we had talked about before, but we always had reasons for never making that move to 100% online um, based on our student population, on our strengths as instructors and things like that. So suddenly we were being forced to make this big change. But I think it was interesting because it was in this context of such a, a huge change on campus. And so um, I think in this very fast, um, change. I think suddenly, it be, you know, the conversation was just so different than any other conversation we'd had before involving the dean and, um, you know, deans and uh, a bunch of layers of bureaucracy at UW. As you know, UW has amazing levels of bureaucracy. Um, and most of the time that just serves, it feels like it might serve just to kind of limit things you can do. You might not even know the chain of command. So anyway, I think the our, our change took place in this very complex environment and in that environment I found that the messaging and um, from very high up trickled down very quickly and I thought had really important implications for how we changed and in my program my division from the dean to the department chair everyone had this very positive messaging everyone very tried to be very crystal clear about our goals why we're changing kind of some of the expectations for changing and it made the change much easier than I would have ever imagined. And I think this was not many people's experiences. I think in, um, I've talked to lots of other friends who had very inconsistent messaging from at UW from maybe a dean and a chair and other um, supervisors about you know, what to prioritize or how to go about the change. Um, in some K-12 settings, you know, just really piling on to the teachers about everything they were supposed to do and how they're you know, when they were supposed to do it and all of those things. So I feel like all of a sudden the bureaucracy really mattered in a way that 
you don't usually see on a day-to-day -day level. And in my experience, it was actually pretty positive um, of seeing this very consistent messaging, see it trickle down super fast of how everyone wanted to prioritize keeping things simple, keeping student learning and the whole student as central, which isn't also a message you always get, but that was very clear. Like we are teaching people and you are people and we have to take all of that into account. We're, I think sometimes in the past, we are cogs in a wheel, you know, and like teaching is this kind of A to B thing that um, happens much more uh, mechanically. And I think suddenly, uh, people started to realize very quickly that we needed to prioritize ourselves and our students as whole people. And I thought that was a really important change that took place that I don't think took place everywhere. Wonderful. Thank you. How about you, Brad or TJ? Thoughts that you would care to share? I'll right. expand in a moment. If TJ doesn't have anything to say, then I'll just pop into the second question. Yeah, so the second question is for, for Brad. How has your job been affected? So um, I think at the outset, I'm going to pick up on one thing that Karen said, which is that our, our tasks at the university are highly individualized. So I can only uh, speak to my experience. This was like a very well-intentioned tsunami hitting me in the middle of a semester that was itself very challenging in the midst of a very challenging year. I was teaching uh, more courses than usual, three courses, all of which were fairly new and just keeping about a, a week or so ahead of the students when all of a sudden my world got turned completely upside down and I had to essentially learn a completely different way of instruction. I think it's important for individuals to realize that teaching online is very different from teaching face to face. It requires a different approach to the material, a different set of expectations of students, as well as different mechanisms of delivery. We usually spend about a semester, at least, in preparing a brand new course if we're gonna teach it online. We had 10 days. And the well-intentioned efforts of the university to provide all sorts of resources really felt like just being overwhelmed with too much information and too little time to really process that. So for me, bottom line was um, my work life turned into 10 hours a day, seven days a week for no breaks for seven weeks. It was exhausting. It was incredibly stressful to try to accomplish all that went on here struggling not only to figure out how to teach online, how to reach students, how to be aware of the variety of problems and stresses they were facing at home, and at the same time, trying to compete with thousands of other faculty members, trying to put thousands of courses online with technology that quite frankly just was not up to the task and failed quite often. So it was really problematical in that regard. Um, I could speak a little bit more about my research. It also had problems. We were just about to go into a situation where we were using a program uh, in our offices that only was residing on computers in our offices and we got locked out. So we had to try to figure out some creative ways of keeping the research program going as well. But amidst all of this stress and very tiresome work, I felt incredibly blessed because I recognized I had a job. I didn't need to worry about my income. Um, I didn't need to worry about little kids wandering around while I was trying to do my work the way that many of my colleagues did. And I didn't face the stresses that I discovered were part and parcel of lives of many of our students living at home uh, in just really some very challenging circumstances. So while it felt horrible at the time, I recognized it really wasn't that bad in comparison to so many other experiences that individuals in various other industries have had through the last two to three month period. Thank you for your perspective, Brad. Um, how about you, TJ, Karen, anything you'd, else you would wanna share about how your job has been affected? I think to echo Brad's point, you know, one of the things that I reflected on early on is uh, the, the fortune that we have. I think the university as a whole is in a relatively strong position, um, you know, and, and that 
changes differently. And as some of us see other things come up, we might think differently. But I think as a whole, you know, being a, a state flagship institution, um, we're hit much less hard than, than some other institutions. And so, um, you know, I think what's changed slightly, um, obviously the technology piece, and I think that that's something that you'll see run throughout many of the answers here. Um, but I think uh, how quickly that um, has fo forced all of us to learn as well. Um, so not only were our students learning in the classroom um, and, and trying to get course material, they're also trying to learn and figure out uh, new technologies, which we tend to think they're relatively good at, um, but they have just as many challenges as we do um, in figuring out some of that as well. Thank you. So the next question is going to come to Karen. Um, so how has your faith come into play through this? I think, I think recently I've been thinking a lot about, um, about theology and about the Bible and faith and all these things. And it's all very interesting and engaging and important. But I think when you um, have a pandemic, which is by nature a social thing, right? It is transmitted from person to person. I think suddenly it really, for me, brought into focus kind of the message of the cross and the message of the Bible, which is about other people and that kind of distills the theology into like, this is about how we treat other people. This is about how we care for other people. This is about how we relate to other people. And that doesn't make everything easy because, I mean, it doesn't, it's not about being nice all the time or something, right? If you disagree with someone, you can, it's okay to disagree with them. You can have disagreements. But to try to understand that that person is part of our community, that person is part of the body of Christ, that person is a person. Um, and so trying to keep that in mind. Um, and that has so many implications, you know, that has implications for your choices about um, how you social distance and things like that. It also has implications for how you treat people who are treating the pandem dem pandemic differently than you, people who you really disagree with how they're approaching it. Um, and again, it doesn't like, there's no clear answers about what that means on a day-to-day -day basis, but I feel like throughout that's really been something I felt that my faith, my participation in the faith community has brought to the fore over and over. It's about our relationship to each other and the way we express our relationship to God is through our relationships to each other, especially in a time like this. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Karen. What about you, Brad, TJ? Anything you'd care to add to that? No, but I, I want to reinforce, well, TJ, you were just about to, so I'll make it real quick. Uh, I just want to reinforce what Karen said. Our faith really centers on community. It's so difficult in these times to really experience that community. So uh, we're grateful to you, Jeff, for organizing this, and Charlie, for the service that you organized this morning. This is really deep and meaningful experiences to us. We connected to students in a very different way. And I think we're, we were able to see parts of their lives that normally they hide from us. Uh, and maybe just recognizing that we are called by Christ to do that on a daily basis as a means uh, of teaching is, is a new message. It's so hard to exist in a state university in a public government institution and be a member of a particular faith community because I'm not supposed to let anybody know that that's part of who I am. But there are just subtle ways, I guess, of living our faith without necessarily proselytizing it. Thanks. And TJ, you had something to say as well? I think Brad picked up a lot of the thoughts and Karen nailed a lot of it too. So I'll leave those thoughts where they are. Okay. Well, the next question's for you anyways, TJ. So don't, un don't unmute yourself yet or don't mute yourself yet. Um, so what have you learned about your job that you did not know before? Yeah, so I think to, you know, echo Karen's response from the first question of, you know, we did a lot of hybrid uh, type work as well. Um, you know, so working, we work with a thousand plus student organizations. We work with 20,000 plus involved students. Um, in order to do that effectively, um, a lot of what we're doing is, you know, remote communicating through email, communicating through presentations, chat services, uh, some of that kind of stuff. 
Um, but I think what I've learned is that um, a lot more of the job than I thought can be done remotely and, and can be done from a you know, non-contact perspective. Um, I think that's difficult. I think uh, for many folks in the kind of student affairs side of the house, so folks that might work um, you know, in housing or in the Dean of Students Office or in counseling or health services, uh, you know, a lot of us get into the work because we wanna interact and build relationships and um, you know, build great experiences for students. Um, and so I think um, I've learned that I've been doing that uh, kind of virtually for quite some time, even though being in a physical place made me feel like I was doing that more. Um, and so I think, you know, understanding that while challenging and difficult, there are ways that you can kind of build relationships and understand more uh, about students kind of moving forward. Um, I think, you know, I've also done a lot of learning about the difficulty in communication when you're not in person, right? Um, so a lot of our office conversation uh, between our staff has been about how do we communicate effectively with each other? We're not even talking about external stakeholders here um, in this time. You know, when we can usually walk down the hall and the doors open or, you know, we have staff meetings that we can kind of see each other in and, you know, um, be in person quite a bit. Um, communication has been a huge kind of shift and something that I think we're all learning to do differently and hopefully better uh, moving forward through this. And then I think the final thing um, that I've learned is just the importance of kind of being a generalist. Um, and I don't know if uh, other folks who work at the institution have felt some of this as well, um, but, you know, to the point of we feel like we're highly specialized and we have you know this one area whether that's a specific um, you know academic discipline or topics that we know a lot about or teach courses on whether that's services that we provide to students um, I think that for many of us we've been comfortable in okay I know my thing I know my lane I'm going to continue to do that and I'm going to do it really well um, I think what this has shown all of us is we have to learn a lot more about how um, we're able to be a little bit more generalist um, and maybe some of our colleagues at smaller institutions might have some more of that. Um, but I think at the UW level, you know, as Brad mentioned, you know, being able to see into students' lives. Um, and I think for us uh, on the student affairs side, it's really been impacted by counseling, food security, housing security. Like these are all things that while we tangentially knew about and interacted with have become a lot more present in this time and place. And so identifying and working with those students who might have some of those concerns and connecting them to resources. I think we're all finding a lot more about um, what is available to students. Um, and then the challenge is how do we get students connected to those things um, in an efficient way so it doesn't feel like we're passing them off, you know, three, four, five times at a time. So um, I think that's another learning moment is what are the resources that campus has available and how do we efficiently connect students to those opportunities. Thank you, TJ. Appreciate that. Um, Karen, uh, Brad, what else have you learned about your job that you didn't know before? I think in, I've experienced kind of a, um, a breaking down of some of the generational differences among how we work. Because, you know, I think in the past, in, in my program, I know there's lots of people one or two decades older than me that are amazing with technology. Um, in my program, it tends to be a pretty clear generational divide. Um, and so, and the younger people's tech savviness is sometimes met with an eye roll, like, oh, great, like, that's nice, you want to do it this newfangled way, but like, our way works just fine, where suddenly everyone had to change, everyone had to work online, and I saw my older colleagues working so hard to do this well, and like, just jumping right in, doing tons of research, we had those 10 days that Brad mentioned, um, they had to do so much more research in those 10 days to just figure out how to use some of the technology. And I saw them digging in really well and then also kind of valuing um, the input of some of the younger um, staff members. So I feel like there was this nice kind of intergenerational shift and appreciation that took place um, that I think is important for, um, you know, I think there's a lot right now about intergenerational working. Um, so I think some good things took place um, to my mind. Thanks, Karen. Uh, Brad, do you have anything you want to add to this? No. All right. Well, you have the next question. Um, so if you could go back in time, what is this, nine weeks ago, 10 weeks ago? If you could go back in time to January 30th, what would you, uh, what advice would you have given yourself? What would you have told yourself? Two things. 
First, don't be so lazy. And second of all, don't be so arrogant. Don't be so lazy spending way too much time watching wild and crazy stories, uh, shows about teenagers on Netflix instead of actually preparing my own wild and crazy classes for students so that I was really prepared to embrace the technology instead of just trying to figure out what I was going to talk about. And also, don't be so arrogant. I guess I've, I still do this kind of. Uh, in the courses that I teach, I'm most concerned about having the students prepared to work with teenagers. I don't care as much about the students and their struggles as, they, as I do their preparation to work with teenagers and their struggles. But honestly, I think it's important to recognize where they're coming from and the wide variety of different directions and backgrounds, picking up a little bit of what, on what TJ said earlier and seeing whether or not the, uh, if there are many roads that lead to the same conclusion and that I need to really anticipate what those roads are from the various hard segments of our student body. The other thing I'm gonna mention, because we haven't so far, is how amazing students were. Uh, students were really reluctant to let me know some of the incredible problems they were facing and uh, the, the stories I could tell you. But um, they, they were all just very calm and appreciative and trying to hang on in uh, there with their own struggles about doing so. If, if you go home to uh, a rather chaotic home situation where you've only got internet for a portion of time and your faculty member says you have 50 minutes to complete this test online, it's a wacky world. And I only had one, one student really kind of flip out on me. The rest were really kind and gracious and understanding beyond what they really needed to be. We deal with an amazing student body at this institution. And I think that's a testament to a lot of the folks who are hanging in there with us on this conversation who have raised students, either past or present, that have been part of the university. Thank you, Brad. What about you, TJ? Karen, any advice you'd give your um, younger, naive, two-month younger self? Okay. Well, the last question comes to TJ um, before we open it up to question and answer. So, TJ, what are some positive things that you will take forward from this uh, situation um, once things I'm going to use the word normal here, but who knows? Um, but when things return to, when things find an equilibrium, what are some positive things you'll take forward from this? I think to continue to build on, on Brad's last point there, you know, resiliency has been huge and it's something that's been in, you know, the, the literature for students for a while here. Um, but I think that this is a real challenge on that. Um, and I, I think that, uh, the resiliency of not only our students and our learners, uh, but all of us as a whole, right, um, is, is going to be really important. And so looking forward to hopefully a lot of the positive effects of that, um, knowing that there will be kind of equal negative effects of what all this um, has done, especially when we look at mental health and uh, a lot of those types of things moving forward. Um, but the resiliency to know that, you know, if things change and when things change and when things change quickly, um, we have the ability to adapt uh, and to continue to move forward. So I think that's a big positive to take out of this. Um, I think learning about technology is also a wonderful positive to take out of this. Um, a, a large part of what I do, it's in my title, right, is to work with technology solutions and, and some of those types of things. Uh, to Karen's point, you know, everyone approaches those as a different, at a different rate. Everyone uh, is able to interact with those at a different rate. Um, but I think there's a lot of really wonderful positive things to come out of that. I think what also has to happen is there has to be a lot more uh, education and training and thinking about uh, what we call the user experience, right? So how are we allowing users to guide what some of that looks like? Um, and so I would imagine that we'll see a wave of, you know, app creation and program creation. And I think one of the challenges we always see with any of that is how do we find something that uh, works and works in multiple capacities. So I think what we'll start to see is, um, you know, some of the generalization of internet tools. Uh, and so there might be things that get added to a web browser, some of those types of things um, that make 
uh, whether that's ordering groceries, whether that's finding your online courses, whether that's video integration, uh, make a lot of that a lot easier. And so I think for the most part, that's positive. Um, clearly there's concerns around security and privacy and all those types of things that we have to consistently balance with any of that. Um, but I would imagine and hope that some things become a little bit easier for folks um, as technology develops out of a kind of need to develop as part of this as well. Thank you, TJ. Um, Karen, Brad, anything else uh, that you'll take forward from this? Any positive things? Well, this is a little old school, but I'll add it. First of all, uh, I can I can pull two all-nighters in one week and still survive. I'm I'm pretty impressed with that. Didn't really know that I had the capacity to do that past the age of seventy. Um, I I also certainly personally recognize I have a lot to learn. Uh, even if I've been in this business for over four decades, there's just a tremendous amount of new ways to learn, new ways to inculcate information that I need to really uh, embrace. But most importantly, I think, is I learned the incredible value of face-to-face -face interactions. No offense to technology, but there's just so much that was missed uh, in the teaching that I did by not being able to see people, to see their, their reactions, to be able to sense their moods and so on and so forth. So I think we're all perhaps, at least many of us are suffering a lot from the absence of those kinds of close encounters with other individuals. I don't know if technology will ever get to the point where we can really compensate for what was lost when we went strictly to online instruction. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Karen? I'll add a little bit about, you know, working with kids at home. Um, you know, I think, you know, I don't, I don't know exactly how this will all shake out, but I just spent like 10 weeks in my house with my kids on something I have never done before, working full time and all of us being here. Um, so that was a very interesting experience. And I think if you told me, I mean, I think in the past, if you told me I have to be a full time parent, let alone a full-time parent working full-time in my house for even a week or two, it really actually caused a lot of anxiety. Like, how am I supposed to like keep these kids occupied and sane? And we just did it for like 10 weeks. And so I think it kind of showed me some of my, just helped me understand myself as a parent and my kids as kids in a slightly different way. Um, and then the relationship between working and parenting and kids, um, I don't know exactly what it's all, how it's all going to shake out, but it was very interesting um, and, and way better, way better than I would have thought. I literally would have thought we would have been a disaster <laughs> um, and, and we all got through. Um, and I think maybe the co-parenting too, where you see your spouse and their strengths and you and your strengths and your kids and their strengths and weaknesses, all of our weaknesses as well. Um, it was interesting. And I hope, I think there's a lot to learn from that as, as I go forward. Not sure exactly what, but it, there's a lot there. Yeah, it really is a, a crucible. And you said that you're, you're staying sane. I, I wonder, have you adjusted your baseline for sanity? Because I know I certainly yeah, have. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And how much TV is allowed. Yeah, that, that's changed a little bit. Yeah, there's a bit of a shift. Um, wonderful. Well, uh, before we open it up to... to uh, questions. I'm wondering, is there are there any last thoughts before um, before I turn the masses on you, Karen, Brad, TJ? Anything you wanna you add before we open it up? All right. Um, so I'll actually be the first person to to ask a question, and it's actually not to the panel. So sorry. Take a seat for a second. Um, I know there's at least one other person on the call who works for the university, and I, I don't know if um, they are in a space where they can share anything right now, but um, is there anybody else here who works for the university who'd like to share a little bit of their reflections, um, having listened to this? Okay. Um, well, then I will gladly open it up for people to ask some questions. Uh, raise your hand. Oh, yeah, Bob, I see you. So I'm going to ask to unmute you. Hey, 
this is a general question. When we had the teachers speak earlier, and Brad kind of touched on this, they raised the concern that this happened halfway through a semester when they had known some of the kids or observed the kids before they ended up going to being all video. What would it be like, or what's your concerns next semester or this summer, if you have summer school, how are you going to approach not really knowing the kids. I know our oldest daughter teaches kids art and she's gonna have new sixth graders, never seen them before. How are, you know, what advice might you give teachers, since you are in a profession of teaching teachers, to how to approach that after you figure it out? Thank you, Bob. Yeah, I'll open that up to, to all three of you. Uh, go ahead. I'll just say that's super true that it felt like we were coasting on like this really great foundation. And in my class, the last six weeks are very project based. So you just have to help the students finish this project. Um, so that, so I am teaching hundred percent online this summer. And that's absolutely like one of the biggest pieces to that. Cause we learned a lot about technology this semester, just about which video platforms work and blah, how to embed this. And, but what we didn't learn about so much was to, build relationships online. And to do that when the class is asynchronous, I'm gonna teach asynchronously, which means we don't actually meet online ever, um, except like we can meet one-on-one, -on -one, but there's no class time. So trying to find ways to connect students um, and to connect ourselves to students. One thing we're talking a lot about is flexibility in platforms. Um, a lot of, most of my students are international students. Most of them use WhatsApp, which is not an application that most of us use, but really trying to help students use the technology they already use and prefer, and then trying to kind of mandate that they connect with each other. Because in my classes, them connecting with each other is as important as them connecting with me. And so we're we're working on that but trying to be really flexible with platforms is one of the first things we're trying to do they don't all need to meet on zoom they don't all need to use google docs whatever but um trying to get them to to connect yeah tj I, thank thank you karen tj i'm particularly curious about this with um with you as you work with student organizations um that having started at the beginning you know having a first semester and the first half of the second semester to build up the organizational structure there. How, how do you see it working with your, um, if you were to start fresh with student organizations? Yeah, that's a big piece of it. And I think honestly, the first thing that came to my mind is orientation, right? So orientation is within kind of uh, the work that I do with colleagues as well. And so bringing in new first year students, right, who are doing this fully online this year. Um, which has never been done before. And so seeing my colleagues over in, in the Center for the First Year Experience, you know, scrambling to do some of this as well. And how do we um, provide an opportunity for students to connect with what we call the Wisconsin experience when they're not physically on campus, right? Um, and, and how do we, you know, I also, um, our department reports up through the union, right? And so we've been talking about all of the, you know, what does it look like when the terrace is closed? And what does it look like when you can't go into a physical space to interact with people? Um, so these big questions. Um, and I think the student organizations piece, you know, honestly, I've been really surprised with how connected those students have stayed to each other. And I think that's the important piece. And to Karen's point of, it's really about the student interactions between each other. Um, that's what we're trying to facilitate as much as possible too. Um, so it's less about like, you know, how do they interact with us, um, but how do we m create sense of community and how do we create a connection to a physical place uh, when many of our students are not in that space. Um, and so, you know, I think a lot about our first year students. Um, I'll be teaching a first year seminar this fall, whether that's online, whether that's a mix, you know, it'll be interesting to see. But a lot of what that course talks about is, you know, here's this resource that you can find in this campus building. Here's this thing that you can attend to learn more about, uh, you know, whatever that might be. Here's a lecture, some of those types of things. Um, and so I think a lot of our students that we see choose the University of Wisconsin um, for its physical placeness and for the um, kind of experiences that they have while here. And so we're struggling to think a lot about how do we provide those experiences and that connection 
um, from a remote uh, type environment. Um, you know, I think our colleagues in athletics are obviously considering a lot of that, and that's a big part of how some of our students identify. Um, but even the, you know, let me walk into a physical building and, and climb the, you know, hundreds of stairs in Van Heist or Van Vleck or whatever it's going to be, uh, or, you know, find the secret spaces and the secret tunnels around campus. Like, those are the things that I get excited to teach my students about. Um, and I can probably tell them about some of those things, but until they're physically able to experience that, it's not going to be quite as uh, wonderful and exciting. Thanks, TJ. Brad, is there anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I really do. About the, I think the challenge of your question is that you're asking a bunch of folks here who deal with college students to advise individuals who are working with middle school students or high school students or elementary school students. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw from my research more than my experience on campus and just suggest that at the younger ages, and, and I think I think you were talking mostly about uh, middle school students. Is that is that correct? Well, in general, that was what was brought up in the when the teachers were chatting. Yeah. In the first one, it was teachers, and that was one of their concerns. Yeah. Was what are they, what are they going to do next semester for them in the fall, when they have not met any of these kids? They don't know what any of these kids, their backgrounds or anything. They can't really study their mannerisms, things that would lead you in teaching won't be available and it, you know i'm just thinking of my daughter yeah in this case okay um, so I'm that's what i thought that so here's what i would suggest that we know that that well we, most of us remember that the first week of school typically was not about learning too terribly much it was learning about how to get along with each other and there is a group dynamic that occurs in a classroom that's going to be difficult to replicate online and there is a teacher student dynamic that occurs as well so I think students are gonna to have to figure out way, uh, teachers are gonna to have to figure out ways of creating that. I know some uh, teachers in the school district reserve time for one-on-one -on -one conversations with their students. There's a bit of good news and bad news here. That's really complicated and very time consuming to do if you wanna do it through a venue like what we're doing here right now. So that's kind of the bad news about it. But the good news is that many of the students, particularly by middle school, are very adept at other technologies, social media. And although it's a little bit dangerous for teachers to be interacting one-on-one -on -one with students uh, in, on social media, we're gonna have to bend the rules and see whether or not uh, teachers can take advantage of those opportunities to get to know and build a relationship with their students very early on in the semester. I really strongly advise them to think very carefully and creatively about doing those kinds of exercises. Yeah. Wonderful, thank you. Um, are there any other questions? Well, I have one that I've been wondering. Um, I'm sure you've seen college students behaving in ways that run counter to how you would make decisions. Um, but I'm wondering, can do you have any any of you have any snapshots of just kind of something beautiful? Um, that you've seen uh, in the past 10 weeks with your students or with your colleagues? What is, what is something beautiful that you've seen um, through this? That's a toughie. <laughs> One of the things that we did in, in my class, it was just part of the class is, to ask individuals to develop some kind of product. This is a course on adolescent development and taken by, by uh, future medical uh, personnel, future educational personnel, future, future youth workers and future parents. And we asked them just to come up with some kind of, maybe it's an app, maybe it's a website, maybe it's a brochure, maybe something that can be shared with a population of adults or young people themselves that would better their worlds. Um, we reserved time in class for them to meet face to face to work on these things. So that blew up so that they simply had to figure out a way of getting together to finish their particular products. And there were a couple students who really were disconnected from their groups. Um, so one beautiful thing was that with just a little bit of a reminder on our part, 
individuals worked very diligently to make the connections uh, between individuals who were part of that group and to be able to somehow uh, come together and help to produce things that were really interesting. And the other thing is just the capacity under very stressful circumstances, not just to survive personally, but also to, to survive uh, communally as a group putting together a product and coming up with some very fascinating things. I guess in many senses, that was really beautiful. Thank you. Karen, TJ, I know this is, it's not a quick answer question. And so if you need some more time to think about it, that's fine, but. I'll just say that I think Brad mentioned before the resilience of the students. And I think that was super impressive. Um, you know, every instructor approached this so differently and they had to figure out the rules for every class suddenly in the middle. Um, and in our department, we took very different approaches too. I moved basically completely asynchronously. I just kind of had students work independently and just check in with me occasionally. Other instructors demanded that their students meet online every time for a class and they felt like there were some real benefits to that. And the truth was though that students did it. They met in the middle of the night. Some of them went back to China. Um, some students from China, they went back to China. Some were in quarantine and very few students missed class. And I think there was some like real worry because UW provided, um, gave students the option to uh, take classes pass fail. Um, any class they wanted, they can take a pass fail grade. And so some concern that students were just gonna completely blow off the semester. I'm sure some did, but maybe they need, maybe that's what they needed for their mental health. Um, but overall, what we saw was students engaging with whatever we asked them to do, um, with all the different rules that were changed in the middle of the semester for them, and they, they really came through. And um, I was, yeah, very impressed with that. Students um, saying, okay, I'm flying to China. I don't know when I'm gonna get there because, um, you know, I think my flight to LA has been canceled, but I'm gonna do this. And I had students stuck in Turkey, but um, they all finished the semester. They got it all done. I've seen a couple of things that I think reflect what I've seen in our church community as well. So I think um, as all of this has happened, the um, opportunity for folks to give of themselves um, and what that tends to take its place uh, in this remote world is um, financially and resources, right? And so I've seen uh, a number of our student organizations um, do some donations, do some fundraising. Um, I worked for a number of years closely with our fraternity and sorority life community. Um, and while uh, they now have less opportunity to socialize and more opportunity to think about how they can be bettering their community, I think that's really resulted in some really great and really fantastic uh, fundraising efforts, uh, food donation efforts. Our student government, uh, ASM, the Associated Students of Medicine, um, has run a food pantry now for two or three years, um, but uh, completely completely uh, amped up what they were able to do, started working with River Food Pantry um, and doing food drop-offs on campus twice a week where students or apartments of students could come and pick up food uh, from Union South twice a week, um, you know, in five and 10 pound boxes. Um, we have a number of student organizations who um, do uh, food recovery efforts. Uh, so they work with grocery stores and bakeries and a couple of things around the campus area um, and take all of their kind of leftover food or food that's kind of gone out of code but is still usable um, and they place it in there's different refrigerators around campus where folks can access that. And so I've really seen those things take off and I've seen folks get more interested in that. Um, you know, we have a student group called F.H. King that does uh, growing out in the Eagle Heights gardens uh, out on the north side of campus. Um, and they've seen some real great interest from folks in the past couple of weeks who are really interested in helping them with kind of some of the services that they provide. So I think um, food security has always been a passion of mine and something that I'm interested in. Um, but I've been really, really uh, amazed at what our students have been able to put together um, first and foremost to help their fellow students, um, but then in the larger community as well. And so I think that that's uh, some really great news and some positivity that I've seen uh, from our students as a whole. Thank you, TJ. Um, we have enough time for one very short question. Um, so if anyone came up with a question that has a five word answer, uh, they can go with it. Um, Otherwise, I want to just take a moment to say thank you to Karen and Brad and TJ. Um, thank you so much uh, for the work that you do, for the, 
ways that you support students, for the ways that you care for people. Um, thank you. Uh, and thank you for sharing with us as well. It's really important for us to hear from one another and especially to hear from people that, that we know and love. And um, so thank you for that. I, I look forward to uh, talking to you guys more about it in person, whenever that may be. Um, I hope that uh, I hope that everybody here is able to join us next week. Next Sunday, we have a panel of medical professionals, and I think that'll be a very interesting um, conversation too. Uh, that and that will be the the last in this series, uh, working differently in different times. After that, we're going to be doing some uh, Bible study on the little books with big impacts, which is our next sermon series. So um, come back next week, come back the following week, and frankly, any other time you want to come back, you're more than welcome. Um, I would love to close us with a prayer before we go, um, but I just want to give the last word to our panelists. Anything you want to say before I pray? Thumbs up from TJ. All right. Yeah, I mean, just thank thank everybody for supporting the university and the university system. Uh, it, uh, we will be going through some challenging times here, and uh, we really, all of us who work at the university, are just deeply appreciative of the, everything that the state does for us. Thank you, thank you, Brad. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we give thanks for the work of your servants for the way that they support and nurture your children. We pray that their work may increase and that they may continue to thrive in what they do. We pray that they may find respite, that they may find rest, that they may find Sabbath, even in and especially amidst the busyness and stress that this pandemic has imposed. We pray thanksgiving for this congregation of learners, for those who are passionate about hearing from one another, we give thanks that you have given us the gift of community that we may learn and grow together. Amen.